Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Natalie. I'm a Proposition Specialist at Refinitiv. Before we begin our webinar, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. Please click the media player on your screen to enable sound and video. If the slides are stuck, please refresh your browser. You can expand your slide window by clicking on the maximize icon on the top right of the window or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide area to expand it. You can also expand the live stream window box. Please submit your questions to the speakers in the Q&A box. We will answer these at the end of the webinar. And finally, the link to the recorded webcast will be emailed to you after the conclusion of the event. You can also access the free trial offer of our ESG data using the banner in the top left corner. Today, we're going to cover six key ESG questions the investment community needs to answer in 2021. Our speakers are Godem Dingra, founder and CEO of High Point Capital Management, and Christopher Olson, principal and portfolio manager at High Point Capital Management. High Point is an independent investment manager based in Chicago, honored to be profiled by the, by the United Nations PRI and the CFA Institute as a case study for ESG integration. We already hosted a webinar with High Point back in 2020. Godem Chris, welcome back. Thank you. Now we know that ESG has been an enormous growth and has seen an enormous growth in the past few years, and especially in 2020. According to a recent report by the Forum for Sustainable and Responsible Investment, total, total sustainably invested assets under management grew by 42% in the U.S. in the last two years. And we believe this growth will only continue in 2021 and beyond. But of course, ESG also puts investors in front of numerous challenges. So what is the first question that needs to be answered today? Gautam, Chris, over to you. Thank you, Natalie. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. My name is Gautam Dingra. I'm the founder of High Point Capital Management. And with me is co-portfolio manager, Chris Olson. Both of us have managed money for a long period of time and built successful performance records. A key ingredient of the investment strategy we have used over the years is the valuation of intangible assets that do not show up on balance sheet of companies. Included in these intangible assets are things like reputation of companies, brand equity, employee morale, productivity, relationship with regulators, and things like that. Over time, some of these intangibles started showing up under the ESG umbrella. So naturally, when ESG data first started becoming available, we were very keen to analyze the data to see if we could use it to generate additional alpha. Now, many years later, we have published a number of articles on ESG matters. And based on our experience in dealing with ESG matters, we have realized that there are six important questions that come up time and again, and we want to share our thoughts about those six questions. So without further ado, let's get to the six questions. <clears throat> Can you see the six questions uh, on the slide? Natalie, can you see the six questions? Yes, I, yes we do. Great. So the six questions that we're going to try to address are, how consistent is ESG investing with the responsibility to discharge one's fiduciary responsibility? Then we will address performance-related concerns. Uh, third, we will talk about the correct way for different types of investors to compare companies when it comes to ESG. Fourth, we would uh, briefly address the issue whether it's better to boycott or engage with companies that might be deficient from an ESG perspective. Fifth, we will talk about the fact that E, S, and G, are they similar or different? And does it make sense to lump them together? And lastly, we will see if we can look back at history to see where ESG investing might go and how we might think of what has happened in the past to possibly avoid some landmines in the future. So those are the six questions. That's great. So before we start with the first question, we'd like to ask the audience to answer the first poll question. 
What is your most important concern about ESG investing? Is it fiduciary responsibility, potential performance penalty, lack of high ESG data, high quality ESG data, something else, or no concerns at all? Just wait a couple of seconds before we move on. About 20 seconds. Let's see the results. So we get 56% for lack of high quality ESG data. Very interesting. Let's jump off to the first question. Over to you, Karim. Great. Uh, Natalie, um if possible, if you could uh, just make sure that the slide that the audience sees on the screen is the one that uh, I'm speaking about, I would appreciate that. Of course, of course. So the first question we want to address it, uh, a question that many trustees of asset pools ask, and that is, uh, if I do ESG investing, would that be consistent with my responsibilities as a fiduciary? And the law, the law on that is um, not so clear unless you spend a lot of time digging through the details of it. And here you see one uh, bullet point that um, I'm going to read for you. Fiduciaries should make decisions that are in the sole financial interest of beneficiaries. And you notice that I have uh, circled the word sole and financial. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is uh, those two are very critical words that any fiduciary must know and address. So fiduciary duty comes from trust law or trust code. And um, the word financial interest does not appear in the trust law. It does not appear even in ERISA it actually comes from the fact that ERISA has clarified over time that fiduciaries should act in a way that uh, maximizes the benefits provided to the participants. And that word, benefits, has been translated de facto to mean financial interest. So what you should know is that ERISA clearly says that fiduciaries should act in the financial interest of um, the beneficiaries, the trust law doesn't say that. So that's a key difference. And it can have some implications for ESG investing because uh, depending upon what type of plan or asset pool you are a fiduciary for, your responsibility might differ. The same thing is true with this word sole interest. So the question of whether you are to act only in the interest of the beneficiaries or can you take into account other benefits that might come from the investment program that you might adopt. Well, it comes down to what type of an asset pool you have, what the mission is, what the charter is. So I bring up these two key points to say to you that if you are a fiduciary and you need to think about ESG investing, those are a couple of keywords that you need to focus on. You need to think about what specifically is the charter of the asset pool that you're responsible for. Now, so the law is what it is. It is somewhat vague, not too vague, a little bit. But on top of that, we um, have government guidance that has been given over time. <clears throat> Unfortunately, in the US, the government guidance has been inconsistent. And on this page, you will see we have uh, provided some language that was given by the Obama administration and the one given by the Trump administration. So even though the two administrations technically both agreed that the principle is operate in the interest of the participants, but nevertheless, the nuanced language that they gave us around that couldn't be more different one from the other. And you can see that as you read the language here. The Obama administration language 
almost encourages consideration of ESG, and the Trump administration language discourages it. So U.S. guidance has been inconsistent. Europe has been much more consistent and has cons consistently said that fiduciaries should take into account ESG factors. So I'm going to address this uh, more from the perspective of USG, U.S. investors because the guidance is unclear. So the question that U.S. fiduciaries have to ask is, can ESG be shown to be in the financial interest of beneficiaries? So let's uh, try to address that next. <clears throat> Our view at High Point is that, yes, ESG investing can be shown to be in the financial interest of the beneficiaries if it is done correctly. In order to do it correctly, you have to look at the historical evidence on risk and return. As I mentioned, that High Point has done quite a bit of research on this topic. And uh, we find that the returns are competitive. We also find that uh, more important than the return, the risk or the volatility of high ESG portfolios is lower. We find that um, high ESG portfolios correlate well with high quality. <clears throat> so those are all relevant factors that fiduciaries can use um, to to uh, come to the conclusion that it is in the financial interest of beneficiaries to possibly do ESG investing. <clears throat> now, it is also worth thinking for a second about these ESG factors. As I mentioned earlier, ESG factors are nothing but just another form of intangible. We all know that things like brands are really important for companies and they are valuable. <clears throat> and my question to you, rhetorical question would be, if brands are important and brands impact the reputation of companies, why aren't some of the other ESG factors similar? They also impact the reputation of the companies and that can have an impact on the ultimate revenue of the company, the profits of the company, et cetera. So our view is that ESG factors are just another form of intangibles and if the other intangibles were important and taken into account by analysts, then ESG factors should be as well. Uh, we also find that ESG factors are becoming increasingly more important in driving, they are true economic drivers of value, uh, more so than they used to be just a few years ago. Uh, take company reputation for a minute. Uh, it used to be that uh, if a company had an incidence where its reputation suffered, the company had plenty of time to um, to hire a PR agency, to do some damage control, fix the problem, and so on and so forth. But in this day of social media, uh, wide dispersion of information instantly, uh, how companies treat their employees, their customers, uh, et cetera, has become more critical and can drive value of companies in a way that was never feasible before. So these, um, some of these social factors, for example, have become more important. In the energy space, everybody knows how important some of these ESG factors have become, so I won't repeat that here. Um, but the bottom line is that um, we think ESG investing can be done in a way that's consistent with fiduciary responsibility. And let me share some data uh, with you uh, on that in the, when we answer the next question. Uh, before going to the data, I do want to point out that um, if you are an ERISA-governed fiduciary, then our suggestion would be to be on the conservative side and make sure that you document that you have looked at ESG investing from a risk return perspective and that you've documented and are satisfied that the risks are competitive uh, and that uh, you have looked at the risk. And our view is that risk data is much more meaningful than even the return data. Uh, and uh, documentation will be critical in our opinion for fiduciaries 
to move forward and feel comfortable with their decisions to do ESG investing. Investors that are not subject to non-ERISA do have more leeway, depending upon their mission uh, and depending upon their um, relationship with the beneficiaries. They are able to go to ESG investing more easily. They are able to do a more um, uh, in-depth form of ESG investing if they choose to do it. Uh, but nevertheless, the process should be similar for both in that understand the legal responsibility and make sure how you are satisfying the legal responsibility and document it. Um, I would give you two uh, reading suggestions if you would like to um, look at it later. There's a recent paper that was published in Stanford Law Review by Shenzenbach and Sitkoff, and you see a reference to that on this page. Uh, this is slide number five. Um, this paper is a, it's a long paper, about 70 pages, but if you are going to do any education with your investment committee, board committee, it'll give you uh, lots of good information on what the legal background is and how you might address the key issues. We also refer to a paper that uh, we wrote recently called ESG Motherhood and Apple Pie. It was published on CFA Institute's website earlier this month. And that paper has a good summary of some of the issues we are talking about. And that paper is available on High Point Capital's website if you go to the publications tab. So either one of those papers might be useful for you if you are interested in the topic of fiduciary duties um, and other ESG questions. Uh, let me address the second question, which gets to the data. Um, so that we should be on slide six at this time, which uh, is uh, labeled addressing performance concerns. Um, That's this slide, uh, thank you. This slide, um, uh, refers to a study that High Point has updated every year for the last five years. And in it, we use the data provided by Refinitiv and uh, use that to see whether high ESG companies outperform or underperform low ESG companies. And the results that we have generated over the years have been pretty consistent. The uh, high ESG portfolio has slightly outperformed um, the performance difference between the two portfolios are not statistically significant. But I think for ESG investors, the question always has been, will I incur a performance penalty? I don't think ESG investors are necessarily saying we want to generate higher returns. They want to make sure that there's no performance penalty. And our data has consistently shown that, yes, indeed, there is no performance penalty. And that paper is also available on our website. Now, other studies have reached similar conclusions. Uh, one study that I liked that's a, that was published uh, about four years ago is um, listed on this slide by Khan, Seraphim, and Yoon in Accounting Review. If you would like to review a paper that does a good job of uh, taking into account not just ESG factors, but also the materiality associated with it, I think you would find that to be useful. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, however, that more than the return data, what I find interesting is the uh, is the uh, risk data. And Natalie, if you could uh, get me to the slide on volatility reduction. Right on. So on this page, you see that uh, the high ESG portfolios have uh, volatility that's lower than low ESG portfolios. Now, this time, the difference is statistically significant. So I'm more willing to put weight on this than I am willing to put weight on the return differential. And anecdotally, you can see how high ESG portfolios perform during the financial crisis compared to the low ESG portfolios. The high ESG portfolios outperformed by 7% in the first year, 2008, minus 35% versus minus 42. They 
clearly underperformed in the rebound in 2009. But if you look at the cumulative return, high ESG portfolios came out looking better in 2008, 2009. <clears throat> That's the same thing was true in the first quarter of last year as well, when we had a significant correction in the marketplace. <clears throat> so our view is that the risk reduction data is frankly more uh, meatier, it's, and therefore it is easier to make the case that risk adjusted returns from ESC portfolios are possibly better than to simply say a return is better. Um, in, in our paper that uh, I mentioned earlier, the paper called, Can You Have Your Cake and Eat It Too? There's also one other factor that we bring up, and that is uh, we find that uh, ESG data from Refinitiv, when we use that scoring and line it up next to the quality factor data provided by AQR, the two of them actually are quite a bit in sync in that high ESG companies seem to have higher quality on average, and that relationship is also statistically significant. And that uh, quality factor, as you know, has been shown in finance literature to be a meaningful driver of return. So we talk about these data points because I think some of these can go in documenting the fact that evidence shows that ESG investing is very competitive from a risk return perspective, and that should provide comfort to those who are considering doing ESG investing. <clears throat> Our bottom line, after we have talked about both the fiduciary duty issues and also some of the evidence, <clears throat> is that um, we're on page eight, slide eight, so even though we think there is data and evidence that supports uh, return competitiveness and even risk reduction, we actually think uh, it is not even necessary to rely on the return enhancement angle at all. We think uh, ESG investing uh, risk adjusted return, quality link, and the realization that ESG factors are becoming more and more economic important economic drivers of value should be sufficient for one to make the case that it is important to take into account ESG. Um, it would be nice if the government uh, guidance on this matter was consistent, but the reality is that it is not. But uh, that is not critical. Uh, we think ESG investing absolutely can stand on its own merit. It doesn't really need the support of the government for us to do it. <clears throat> so we've addressed uh, two uh, topics so far. Let's um, talk about the third topic as well. So before we move on to the third one, Gautam, I just wanted to remind the audience, uh, as I see the questions coming in, we'll be taking uh, those questions at the end of the webinar. Over to you, Gautam. So the third question we want to address briefly is um, if you are evaluating and comparing companies from an ESG perspective, should that comparison be done based on a score that has been assigned in an absolute sense or should it be done using a score that has been generated by comparing a company to its peer group, meaning the companies in the same industry? Our view is that both types of scoring have relevance, um, but it probably depends upon the type of investors you are and your mission. We think absolute scoring is more relevant for those who are mission-oriented investors. And um, to simplify it, let me just take the example, a charitable organization is a mission-oriented investors, and ERISA or a pension plan is not a mission-oriented investor. So our view is that mission-oriented investors would find absolute scores whereby companies compare to all other companies regardless of the industry. In other words, you are 
trying to make sure that the company in absolute terms is doing good, not just relative to its peer, but in absolute terms. On the other hand, we think relative scoring is likely to be better suited for those who are being governed by ERISA or similar standards because uh, the issue of uh, sole interest of beneficiaries and financial interest of beneficiaries, remember those two keywords that I mentioned at the beginning, those would likely influence your thinking in um, saying that, in realizing that if you were to use absolute scores, you might be leaving out companies and may, may be difficult to justify that given the fiduciary standards associated with um, ERISA type of investing. And our suggestions for uh, ESG rating companies would be that they make both absolute and relative scores available to investors. So the investors can use them uh, in a way that's most meaningful for their own missions. This is very interesting, Gautam. If I can comment on on that question, as well as the result of the poll, we got, the first poll we got, the quality of data is key here. And when it comes to our methodology at Refinitiv, uh, we follow a, an objective and data driven approach to scoring. Uh, we take we take information from public sources, whether it is annual reports, uh, stock exchange filings, news sources, and more to capture 450 company level ESG measures, of which a subset of 186 of the most comparable and material data points per industry are selected and power the overall scoring process. So it is a relative approach because the weights we give to E, S, and G defer per industry as we take into consideration the impact, comparability, data availability, and industry relevance of every measure across, across industry groups. However, we also provide uh, all the data and the tools necessary uh, for an absolute scoring approach uh, if needed. So please reach out to me if you require more information on the matter. I'll be more than happy to, to explain that as well. So let's move on to the next question. So boycott or engage. Over to you, Chris. So if we take a look. Great. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Gotham. You know, one of the other questions and an important issue we keep encountering is whether or not we should exert our influence by just boycotting companies that are deficient from an ESG perspective. For example, just completely exclude fossil fuel companies regardless of their ESG scores or actions to address their fossil fuel impact or include such investments that we could attempt to exert some degree of influence over their ESG policies. So how do you shine the spotlight on questionable ESG practices? What's the best way to exert an influence on management to change those practices? So do you refuse to invest and thereby seek to raise the cost of capital for such a company, basically forcing them to incur a penalty for their perceived poor practices by depressing the share price and diminishing shareholder returns? Or do you buy the share an attempt to influence management by proxy votes, interaction with management, et cetera. So one question we have for the audience is, you know, which of the two concepts is the primary driver for your strategy, boycott or engage? I am certain most people would answer both to a certain degree, and it'll also depend on your particular strategy. Dawson mentioned, and, you know, if you're mission-oriented, it could be a bit different. But we're curious if you had to pick one as the primary driver of your strategy, what would it be? Boycott or engage? Great. So we'll leave another 20 seconds for the audience to answer. Gautam, I don't know if you're on mute, just because I'm hearing an echo when Chris is talking, just to um, just a quick reminder. Five more seconds. Great, let's see the results. 68.9% engage, Chris. Great. That's kind of what we've been seeing, I think, and as it's developed over time. You know, it's certainly easier um, to boycott, and that's where the industry started with negative screens in the beginning. Um, 
And we do, still do see some clients that are interested in that type of strategy, but increasingly it's, it's the engagement side of things that's taking, uh, that's taking hold. It obviously takes a bit more time and energy, right? It requires your, your active involvement, um, but we would argue is probably more consistent with discharging the fiduciary responsibility that Gotham discussed earlier. Basically, it forces you to consider, understand and react to the ESG factors at play in a company. And we've noticed, um, we've been doing this for quite some time, um, that over the years, clients are becoming more demanding. Whereas before, a simple negative screen, you could leave things out, is certainly acceptable. Um, but increasingly, they're expecting us to take a more active role with their investments. A negative or simple ESG, ESG screens really are no longer competitive if you want to win an account. Um, you know, your client will want you to explain how you're making it difference and getting down to the point where actually how you measure that and can you show them the results from your actions and the impact that portfolio is making and we see that in RFPs that we get uh, and in the conversations we have with clients you know that initial skepticism even from just a few years ago really um, I think has gone away uh, everybody really is um, taking this to heart incorporating it and uh, really trying to raise the game you know, this is a competitive environment. Uh, bars constantly being raised and clients want to see that. You know, and if you're, you know, simply boycotting certain sectors, another important point is, um, okay, this has been fine in this latest run up with growth versus value. You know, you could basically leave out energy and materials, two areas where people have a significant number of ESG concerns. Um, and those have significantly underperform. Technology has been the place to be. Right? Technology is one of the areas that certainly ranks better from an environmental perspective, basically because it has very little impact on the environment. And that's the sector that's, that's outperformed. So what happens um, when that trend reverses? Right? I think um, ESG investors certainly, from the data that we've seen, are overweight technology. And that's great. That's worked. Um, but, you know, we've been around the business long enough to see most of these, uh, these trends reverse. You know, how will your portfolio fare uh, if value comes back uh, into a leadership position? What happens if energy and materials are driving performance, right? And Microsoft, Alphabet, GameStop, okay, maybe not GameStop, um, are ones that actually go in reverse, right, and start hurting performance. Um, will your clients be as uh, forgiving if your performance begins to lag? Um, that's certainly a question I think that will come to the fore. Um, and if you've avoided these sectors as well, will you ha have the, the skill set right, and the experience to analyze um, some of these sectors that have not been um, the most popular, energy, materials, certain parts of industrials, utilities, et cetera? Uh, we'll need to develop that skill set if we start to take a look at those areas. You know, in terms of the engagement side of things and uh, the active nature of that and what we can actually do, um, you know, we're a small firm, and sometimes people would say, okay, what impact can you have? Obviously, if you are a BlackRock, Vanguard, or Fidelity, you know, the size and the impact that you can have on proxy voting matters um, and can be quite substantial. Um, but, you know, we need to add our voice to this as well. It's not just the size of the voice, but it's the, it's the number and the quality of voices as well. Um, and I, and I, I had mentioned before, our clients are expecting us to contribute to that. So they want to see that we're actually truly committed to the cause. If we take a look at the next slide, and this is where I think it gets interesting because there is the concern about the quality of data. Um, and the differences that we see within E, S, and G. And we all tend to throw the ESG term around as a simple, all-encompassing concept, but the E, the S, and the G are very different, um, and they impact companies in a very diverse manner. So what's your goal or your mission? What's most important to your clients? And what issues rise to the surface and matter the most, given the company you're analyzing and investing in? If we take a look at the chart, we move on to the next one, Natalie. You know, as we can see in the chart highlighting energy used, water used, and CO2 emitted, and those are three top of mind factors when determining a company's impact on the environment. 
certain sectors stand out, right? So for example, so four out of the 11 sectors account for most of the environmental load. It's, uh, it's not evenly distributed. You really have to focus on the different sector if you want to take into account the environmental impact. And certain areas stand out. And who would have thought that utilities, for example, really are where more of, most of the water used is and the CO2 emitted is. So if those are major concerns of yours, um, that's where you should be spending your time and energy. So either by boycotting utilities, if, if that's your strategy, and if you want to avoid companies that use a lot of water or, or emit a lot of CO2, or that's an area that you want to be actively engaged in because you can actually make a difference. Right? It's actually more important than energy, which is top of mind, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But obviously, energy is at the forefront. Um, who would have thought? But utilities is one of the areas that you really need to pay attention to if you want to make an impact on the environment. I, I, I really like how. We, we, sorry, yeah, sorry, Chris. Ahead, I just want to say I really like how you uh, kind of separated environment to three subcategories. We actually do the same thing in our methodology. So, um, we, for for environment, for example, we have three subcategories. For the environmental pillar, uh, we have emissions, innovation, and resource use, and we give a score to each of those subcategories, which allows the investor, um, you know, it gives room for a more detailed ESG analysis at the end of the day. So I really like how, how you organize that slide. Just like a little comment over here. And, you know, and to Natalie's point, and certainly with the first quiz question, where people are concerned about the quality of data, um, you know, we've seen a huge improvement in the quality of data, particularly over the past five years. If you went back five years ago, you really couldn't do any, you know, quantitative analysis because there wasn't a long enough history. You know, the data wasn't as robust. We've seen that improve tremendously. I think that's the first point. And the second thing is, you know, we have some of these major factors, but if you're interested in any of these environmental issues, there are a lot more factors you can look at. I think as Natalie had mentioned before, you know, 450 company level ESG data points, um, 186 uh, really important ones. So it allows us to drill down very deeply into the particular issues that matter to that specific company, maybe to you as an investor or particularly to your client. Right? They may want to know a bit more about what's in your portfolio. And we now have the data actually to give them an accurate picture and to highlight their concerns. And it actually it certainly helps the conversations with the clients and we discuss what we do. So if we take a look at, at energy, um, we can basically see that the um, a one size fits all policy doesn't make sense, right? It really doesn't make sense to, to compare a technology company and an energy or, or a utility in terms of the amount of energy they use because the business model is very different. Right, um, technology communications are, are a go-to for ESG investors because of their, you know, their good environmental ESG scores. But that's basically because there's a limited impact on the environment from these. So encouraging Facebook to improve its water usage or carbon carbon emitted really isn't going to move the needle very much when it comes to the environment. Your efforts likely better spent elsewhere. And so are we going to change the world by avoiding or ignoring these issues or, or dealing with them directly? And you can probably sense our bias for actively engaging in these kind of companies. So again, a one-size-fits-all policy for environment doesn't make sense. You really have to drill down into the data, um, and it's very specific to the type of company that you look at. Um, you know, and as we mentioned before, again, you know, if you in the boycott or engage discussion, you know, just avoiding – um, areas with a large environmental impact is really going to give you some significant tracking error in your benchmark. And I think that's something we don't pay enough attention to at this point, again, because these there are cycles uh, in the investment markets. We've seen tremendous outperformance of growth over value. And we just have to be mindful that that's probably going to change at some point. And what kind of risk do we as investors in our portfolio have um, if we're greatly underexposed in these sectors where the performance could turn. And I think, you know, when you, know, you have a good ESG portfolio and you're outperforming, everybody's happy, but how committed are your clients going to be if, uh, okay, you're still say you're committed to ESG, low environmental impact, but your performance starts to lag, right? And then we'll see, you know, how committed your clients are 
um, and that'll probably be uh, an interesting period to figure out um, what your overall strategy would be. And we would basically say it's important at this point before it really turns to start thinking about how you might include some of these uh, stocks in your portfolio and exposure to these sectors in a thoughtful manner, an engaging manner, um, and in an ESG thoughtful framework. Um, we think that's pretty important. You know, if we take a look at the next chart, um, you know, S&G uh, incorporate a number of other substantial issues as well. But what we're finding here is that the difference is not all that dramatic. Um, you know, governance factors have been at the forefront of investors' minds well before ESG became a hot topic. You know, and it's no surprise that with the spotlight on that, you know, so for example, if you look at director independence or if you look at separating the roles of chair and CEO, you know, those numbers are high and consistent across the board for the most part, right? And that's not a surprise. Uh, the spotlight's been on that. Companies have had time to adjust. Investor pressure has been there and has been consistent for quite some time. Um, and interestingly, if... Um, you know, you take a look at um, technology, which ranks high in terms of ESG, particularly with regard to the environment. They do lag when it comes to the separation of chair and CEO. So no sector is perfect. No sector has top scores, of course, the, across the board. And there's always uh, room for improvement um, and a different focus depending on your client and your strategy. You know, if we take a look at the diversity issues, which have really come to the fore uh, most recently, um, you know, we've seen companies seek to raise their game there, but again, it's it's still pretty consistent across um, all the diverse sectors. You know, so if cultural diversity is important to you, um, ironically, the energy sector has been a leader. So this isn't really a, a major outperformance, but they've actually taken a lead when it comes to cultural diversity at board level. So again, um, the picture is not uniform. One sector doesn't tick all the boxes at the highest level. And if we're to take a look at, um, you know, these areas, uh, you know, a, a one size fits all policy um, comparing across sectors is much more realistic, right? And the common theme here is basically people. All these companies have people, S and G focus on people um, and how they govern themselves and the company. So it would make a, a lot of sense that um, you know, we can compare these companies across sectors, much more consistency. And if you do that, um, you're also gonna have much less of that uh, benchmark tracking error that we talked about, particularly when it comes to the environment. And these issues, we find it interesting having done this for, for quite some time, um, it's a moving target with these ESG issues. We'll talk a little bit that, about that in the next section, but um, certain issues come to the fore. It's addressed. You can see that in the proxies that come up every season. You can see that in the conversations that you have with management. You can see that in the literature. Um, and we need to have a framework um, that can evolve with that. And we'll address one issue at a certain point, just like we did with, say, the independence of directors at one point and uh, separation of uh, the chair and the CEO role. Now we're looking at issues of gender and cultural diversity. So we need to be aware of um, the different metrics that we have that Refinitiv can provide to us, what it tells us about those companies, and it can inform our conversations, um, not only with management, but uh, with clients as well. And again, this is a constantly evolving framework and um, you know we need to adapt to it. That's actually, as an investor, um, I think one of the fun things about this, right? We don't, it's really not all that interesting if it stays it's the same all the time, but um, it's constantly moving and we can make a difference within that. We take a look at um, the next question. You can also say, okay, what can we do? Where can we look back to um, to get a sense for, you know, the impact? Oh, Natalie, is it a quiz question? That's right, Chris. Another okay. quiz question to the audience. Uh, which factor is most important from your organization's viewpoint? So E, S, or G, or all are equally important. Another 20 seconds for the audience to, to answer. 
All right. Interesting result, Chris. Governance and all equally important got the same percentage. So, okay. You think yeah, of that? I think people are, you know, yeah, and I and I would say in the beginning, you know, environmental yeah, may have come to the fore because that was one that uh, stood out. Um, I think people are becoming much more thoughtful about this and looking at it in a comprehensive framework. So that doesn't uh, that doesn't surprise me at all. We can move on to the next and the final question. So having had a framework that incorporates intangibles and has looked at many of these ESG factors, um, you know, we've been around and seen the impact of ESG types of uh, forces, you know, over the past several decades. And if we take a look back, you know, where could we learn the most from this or what period or what sector um, really has most in common with what we're seeing these days is probably got to be the tobacco industry, um, you know, way before fossil fuels were in the crosshair of activists and investors and regulators. Um, the tobacco industry in the late 20th century faced a tremendous amount of pressure. And even though we didn't discuss it in ESG terms, that was pretty much it. It was concerned about the health um, of the population and uh, consumers of the product uh, and the impact that it had. And so you saw a tremendous amount of pressure um, from products, liability lawsuits, um, the companies were forced to suppress marketing, and the government imposed taxes on its, prog on its products to reduce demand. Um, the pressure on the industry was, was certainly intense, um, and that forced the, uh, the tobacco industry to change. Now, one of the things it obviously did is it reduced its growth rate and its profitability uh, and the um, and the multiples that um, investors would, uh, would apply to the stock, so the impact was was dramatic. Tobacco did have a few aspects to it that allowed it to continue longer than people might have thought. Obviously, it's an addictive product. Um, there are lack of good substitutes. I know they've tried, tried to develop a few, and we've seen vaping and other things like that, but it really hasn't taken hold. Uh, and we've seen consumer brand loyalty for certain products. They were able to retain some power for quite some time, but um, nonetheless, the impact um, was dramatic. It um, definitely impacted their revenue growth, profitability, and like I said, the multiples that investors would be willing to pay for um, for the stocks. Now we look at the oil companies, which are kind of like the old tobacco companies. They're facing the full force of uh, investor concerns, particularly from an ESG focus. Um, we're talking about a commodity here. They don't have the addictive nature necessarily. Um, and um, really the determination of the pricing power is going to come from, you know, the intersection of uh, demand and supply. So if local demand's high, they'll do fine. If not, um, we'd expect it to be weak. And, you know, oil and its byproducts are used for transportation. So until we see uh, competitive products come in, they'll be around for a while, but nonetheless, the, uh, the impact on the sector has been intense. And, you know, we have on the, the next slide, um, just addressing that and the competition from renewables, which the oil companies are certainly facing. You know, we're starting to get to the sweet spot here where, there are competitive um, energy sources. And so obviously we've seen one fossil fuel area, um, coal uh, get priced out by natural gas and certain parts of the, uh, the, uh, the oil, uh, the, the wind and the solar sector. Now, one thing that's different this time around though, I think is that ESG is a lot more firepower. Um, much more so than it did when uh, tobacco was around. There's a lot more data. We've talked about that. Um, the, the quality of the data is getting much, much better. The amount of data is certainly there. Better analytical frameworks, clearer metrics. Um, we're seeing tremendous development of all those things. And there's a much greater consensus now among investors that ESG has to be taken into account. Much greater buy-in from the population and so we would expect a much more dramatic impact. And if you combine that with the internet, for example, um, it can really focus attention on certain companies um, and you have to react quickly. Um, and these managements we're seeing are trying to be a bit more proactive because 
because, you know, once you get bit by this or an issue comes up, it's very hard uh, to recover from it. And so we're actually seeing companies being much more proactive. Um, the oil industry and the impact on that's been dramatic. I'm watching that over the past number of years. There was the focus on reducing carbon emissions, and we saw a lot of proxy votes on that, focus on management and reducing it. And uh, that's evolved and moved on. And now we're, you know, ending or reducing flaring to reduce uh, greenhouse emissions. There's a focus on minimizing methane emissions, improving water usage. Um, and and uh, there's been a tremendous um, redirection by many of these managements to areas like renewables, right? They have to adapt. The force here has really been, like I said, dramatic. And we've seen these managements um shift and adapt at a much more rapid rate and the impact on the sector has been, been very dramatic and okay oil and fossil fuels are at the, the forefront at this point it's going to be another industry before you know it um, this is definitely a phenomenon that's not going away it's picking up intensity and speed and it's obviously something we need to be intensely aware of Awesome. Would you like to take over on the uh, the next slide? So for the um, conclusion, God. yes, I want to leave most of the time for Q and A. So let me be really quick in um, giving the conclusions. So our view is that uh, ESG investing can be consistent with fiduciary responsibility, but it should be done right, specifically document the evidence, um, make sure that you are clear that what you're doing is, in your opinion, in the interest of the beneficiaries. And I did point out that depending upon the asset pool that you manage, the responsibility would differ. Uh, we shared with you some of the data and papers. Uh, by all means, look them up. We think they can be helpful to you in deciding whether ESG investing works from your organization or not. We made some points about the fact that we think engagement with companies is better than boycotting. And for most investors, especially ERISA-oriented investors, we think relative scoring is better than uh, uh, absolute scoring. Uh, so those are some of the key conclusions, uh, and we hope you find them helpful. We are ready for Q&A, Natalie. Excellent. So before we start with Q&A, I just want to remind the audience, uh, please share any question you have in mind. If we don't get to answer every question during the webinar, because we only have a couple of minutes left, we will email you. Uh, and we also invite you to request the 30-day complimentary access to Refinitiv ESG data using the free trial window box next to the Q&A section. So we have a first question here from Mayan. Uh, hi, Dr. Dingra. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm curious, uh, have you seen a strong correlation between ESG scores and the size of companies? Is the high ESG score possibly caused by the size factor as larger corporations tend to have more resources deployed to ESG-related areas? Uh, it's a great question. The answer is yes and yes. We have seen positive correlation and uh, it is also true that large corporations have more resources. Um, now, having said that, when we did our research work, we did uh, adjust for the large cap bias. Uh, and uh, what we found was that the competitive returns of the high ESG portfolios nevertheless persisted even after we adjusted for the large cap bias. So the answer is, yes, there's a large cap bias, but ESG still works despite the large cap bias. Great. Um, so next question here from Anne. Uh, what data is available for municipal bond issues? How is the quality of the data viewed? Do we provide this data? Um, I can take this question. So we do have municipal bond pricing data. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you want more information on, on this, and I can definitely assist you. If you have an account manager, you can also reach out to him, and he'll give you more information on the matter. Um, so we have here also another question. Um, 
I'm on a finance and investment committee for a not-for-profit organization. May I share this information with my fellow committee members? We are presently in discussion about being more ESG conscious and establishing our investment policy. Uh, so, of course, uh, you can share... Uh, the information with the with the board. Uh, we will also be sending uh, a video uh, of, of this webinar. Uh, you will receive it on demand and you can sign in to replay uh, the webinar. Um, so let's see here. Uh, we have another question referring back to the absolute or relative terms. Uh, should ESG assessments be in absolute or relative terms? I don't know if you want to <laughs> Just circle back a little bit uh, on that, uh, Gautam. Yeah, so uh, yeah. we think depending upon, depending upon the um, type of asset pool that you oversee, relative or absolute scores would work. We think mission-oriented investors, such as charitable organizations, would find absolute scores to be more meaningful, whereas uh, ERISA types of investors who have to be more careful about operating in the sole financial interest of beneficiaries would find the relative scores to be more meaningful. Regardless of the score you use, I think it's important to uh, document that uh, you have looked at the evidence and um, document the evidence that shows that the risk-adjusted returns are very competitive and one point that I think I neglected to make, it was written in the slides, when you do a manager search, uh, I think it makes sense for ERISA fiduciaries to compare ESG-oriented managers against a broad universe of managers so that if you hire an ESG manager, you can show that that manager's risk-adjusted returns were as good or better than some of the alternatives that you were considering. And I think that would go a long way uh, in satisfying the um, requirements. And also our suggestion would be that you benchmark even ESG-oriented managers against broad market benchmarks rather than ESG-specific benchmarks. That way, nobody can um, make the argument that you might have cut some slack to an ESG manager. Excellent. Um, there's a question that just came in. Um, there's a minimum of assets that cannot be considered ESG compliant, U.S. bonds. So in theory, uh, your portfolio can only go as far to be ESG compliant. Yeah, I think what the uh, person asking the question is referring to the fact that is, is the point that ESG data are most available for uh, equity, equities, a little less, less so for fixed income and even less so for other asset classes. So th that point is valid. Um, and we are obviously equity investors at high point and find the data to be quite good, but I understand the limitations. Um, and hopefully over time, other asset classes would start developing that data as well. Natalie, you may have some thoughts on ESG data in other asset classes. So we do provide uh, for other asset classes ESG data like municipal bonds and uh, also corporate bonds. So please like, do not hesitate to reach out again uh, and we can provide uh, the information that you need on that. Um, I'll just tackle one last question, Bottom. So uh, large tech companies like Amazon uh, and Facebook rank high in E and S but have two uh, two tired voting rights, if any. Don't they fail the G category? What are your thoughts on that? Right. So the uh, th that's a very important question. So it is correct that any company that has two-tiered voting structure does fail the governance test to an extent. And there, the, then the question that the investors have to ask is, is the management's interests are aligned with my interest despite the fact that the voting structure is two-tiered. And I'll give you a real-life example. There's a, a well-known investor named John Malone, who has been the CEO and chairman of various media companies over the years. And his companies always have two-tiered structures. So the governance on the surface 
is not good enough. However, what his track record shows over the last 30 years is that he has uh, taken shareholders with him when he has generated value. He has not disproportionately taken that share for himself. So his track record overcomes the uh, concern that on the surface governance is not good enough. And that's what you have to do when it's a two-tier structure. You have to evaluate the management, ask questions, and decide whether you are willing to overcome that concern. And in one case that I just gave you, we are willing to overcome that concern. This is great, Gautam. Um, thank you so much. Um, we will end the webinar. It is at 12 p.m. Eastern time. So uh, thank you so much for the presenters and the audience today. It was a great presentation. And just to uh, remind everybody, I know there's a a lot of questions that came in we didn't have the chance to cover. We'll be answering those uh, individually, uh, and you will also receive the on-demand video for the webinar. So thank you all. Thank you, Gautam, and thank you, Chris. Um, it was great having you today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.